morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Toronto Center's uh, webinar on pandemics and financial stability, not to be confused with our pandemics and financial inclusion series. I am Bob Akabasada, CEO of Toronto Center. Um, let's take a, this is the fifth episode we are uh, presenting to you. And the last, uh, the first one was launched in the middle of March. So there's a bit of time for reflection. So there's a couple of quotes I'd like to read to you that are kind of indicative of the times. This first one is from the IMF. The coronavirus pandemics is a different kind of shock. Never before have modern economies shut down at the drop of a hat. So unlike the 2008 uh, crisis, banks are not the source of the problem this time. There's no bad guy to catch. But this time, banks should be part of the solution. Uh, central banks, uh, treasuries, and also supervisors of the authorities have stepped up in unprecedented ways. Anything short of that would have been considered probably unpatriotic and insensitive to the many who are in the main street and suffering from the current conditions on a daily basis. This is a final quote I'm going to read you. It's from the um, ECB, European Central Bank Supervisory Authority. Extraordinary liquidity measures very large public guarantees, historically high support for households and firms, and last but not least, unprecedented flexibility in supervision. So that's something that is to keep in mind. So some of the rules may have been relaxed, some of the uh, oversights may have been postponed. This is truly a panoply of public initiatives that will play their role in helping banks absorb the shock, remain sound, and keep providing vital support for the real economy. So let's reflect on that for a second. In today's episode, uh, we sit down with two prominent uh, supervision veterans to cover the supervisory and financial stability dimensions of this unprecedented pandemic. We circulated their bios to you in advance. I have certainly enjoyed very much working with them and they have had profound influence in my thinking on issues regarding supervision, leadership and change management. Clive Brio, is the chair of uh, Banking Advisory Board of the Toronto Centre and a long-time program leader, taught in many of our courses around the world. Paul Wright is a member of our Banking Advisory Board and also a long-time uh, instructor program leader at Toronto Centre. Uh, I don't want to embarrass them, but together they have about 80 years or so experience in matters related to supervision, oversight, financial regulation. And each of them has had distinguished careers in the UK financial um, oversight authorities of different kind. I would like to thank our uh, sponsors, Global Affairs Canada, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, or CEDA, the International Monetary Fund, uh, Jersey Overseas Aid, the USAID, and Comic Relief, without whom we could not um, bring this kind of a program for you and also achieve our mission. Before I start, I know that many of our viewers have questions. We encourage you to see your questions and we have a lot of time for them to respond to them. Please type your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box, the Q&A. And we will answer as many as the time allows. So, welcome gentlemen, it's really great to have you. Okay, Clive, I'm gonna start uh, with you. In addition to being a healthcare catastrophe, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a major economic crisis. You are the author of a Toronto Center note, or TCNs as we call them, on business continuity planning for supervisors. In the midst of such, in the midst of such a shipwreck, how can business continuity plans help supervisors today? What should be in them? And how should supervisors ensure their BCPs are up to date? Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for that, Babak, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I think the correct starting point here is to remind ourselves of the purpose of a business continuity plan, namely how uh, an institution should respond to a serious incident in order to maintain or resume its critical activities. And for that reason, it's also important that that business continuity plan is very much uh, owned by and monitored when in uh, preparation and implementation by the board and senior management of the institution. 
So in this case, we certainly have a serious incident. We have the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, one result of that has been that staff uh, have been uh, finding it difficult to travel to work um, or they have been not allowed to travel and the offices of the supervisory authority have been shut. And in this case, you can't simply all go to the backup site because that doesn't work either in this kind of problem. Or regrettably, in some cases, uh, staff may be too ill and therefore unable to work. What should a business continuity plan help a supervisory authority with? Well, first of all, in identifying its critical activities, uh, especially given the negative economic impact arising from the COVID-19 outbreak. Now that implies that the critical activities might include uh, the prudential soundness of supervised firms, uh, the monitoring of market conduct, the close monitoring of retail conduct and money laundering activities because uh, those things might uh, conceivably be easier for people to manipulate uh, during a crisis. And last but not least, crisis preparedness in case uh, a number of financial institutions begin to fail as a result of the COVID-19 repercussions. Second, um, the less critical activities, uh, those activities of the supervisory authority which if necessary could be delayed, undertaken less frequently, uh, phased over a longer period or repurposed. And examples of those might include uh, the length of time it takes to do the authorization of a new institution. Uh, it may mean the delay in some policy measures, um, cutting back on regulatory reporting by at least some firms, uh, less frequent risk assessments, uh, and perhaps a lower quantity of thematic visits to firms and repurposing those thematic visits to focus more on the implications of the COVID-19 outbreak. And then the third element uh, of the business continuity plan would be asking the question, what resources are needed for the supervisory authorities to deliver the critical activities? Uh, what does that require in terms of people, technology, data, information, decision-making processes, documentation of those decisions, uh, and the ability to uh, access outsourced services? Uh, and clearly in the case of this particular incident, there is particular focus on the ability of staff to work from home in terms of the availability of hardware, software, um, some sort of home office space, connectivity, and so on. And those issues were covered at some length in previous webinars in this series, particularly those involving supervisors from Jersey and Peru. And then perhaps just a final point to make here is that as with any activation of a business continuity plan, uh, this is always an opportunity to learn lessons, uh, to run a live test, and therefore an opportunity also to go back at the end of the uh, incident and update the business continuity plan accordingly. Because if you don't have an updated business continuity plan or you don't have a business continuity plan at all, uh, you're starting from a very low base and it's much more difficult to undertake those core elements that I described a moment ago. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. And uh, uh, Paul, let me uh, turn to you. Building on what uh, Clive was saying, could you please elaborate on your recent publication for Toronto Centre on 10 issues for supervisors during the crisis? I am primarily interested, Paul, to know what do you see as the main issues that supervisors need to consider in a crisis and what are the potential suggestions for how these might be addressed, uh, both generally and in the current crisis? Thank you. Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Um, thank you, Babak. I mean, the first point to make, I think, about the uh, 10 points or the 10 issues paper is that we were very well aware when, I, when writing this paper that most supervisors around the world were almost certainly already in some sort of crisis mode. So we were rather keen not to produce sort of something that was telling people they knew already, but rather than that, the intention really was to produce a sort of checklist which said, look, these are the issues you really need to be thinking about, and it would be a good idea to 
measure yourself against these. So it wasn't really something to be done from scratch. We were aware that a lot of people were doing these things already. And I'll talk about some of the themes that came up. The first one was BCP, Business Continuity, and Clive's talked about that obviously at length and I won't repeat it, other than to say one thing, which is that, you know, it's in the nature of business continuity planning that this should be something that, fir uh, that firms and supervisors do anyway. They should do it in business as usual, in a sort of generic sense. So if something went really wrong and we couldn't carry out our functions in the normal way, how would we respond? And in this particular crisis, what... Um, a number of supervisors did, and it was very wise, was to take a short period, I mean, 24 hours, one working day, or maybe two at the most, to say, okay, we have our generic plan. What are the specific issues of this crisis which we now need to deal with? So in other words, let's go from the general to the specific. And it quickly became apparent that when they did that, of course, this is an unprecedented uh, event, both in terms of its severity, but also in terms of the breadth of the implications of it. So one, the first element was BCP. The second was communication. And I, I sort of hesitate to say this because it sounds rather obvious. People always talk about, you know, communication, communication and all that. But it really is important in a case like this. The, to take an example, supervisors need to be able to communicate with their firms in uniquely difficult circumstances. Many of the firms, most of the firms actually, the staff will be working from home. It's not possible to do on-site visits, so which are great, but many supervisors attach great importance. So the message here is that there's a need for creativity and flexibility and the use of unconventional channels to get the information that you need to enable you to do your supervisory job. And if that means, for example, that some things that you do on-site, you have to re-engineer to be able to do off-site. If it means that sometimes firms aren't able to produce data in the form that you would normally wish, but are willing to give you their management information instead, you should be willing to be creative and flexible in that way. You also need, of course, to communicate with other stakeholders. Most crises involve some other stakeholder. I mean, the central bank, for example, if that's not the same as the supervisory authority. I think it's clear that this crisis, the number of stakeholders involved is unprecedentedly large. Finance ministries, central banks, financial crime specialist agencies, and so on. All of those need to be communicated with because of the breadth and the multifaceted nature of the crisis. And finally, under communication, staff. Um, of course, you need to communicate with your staff who are likely to be working off-site, working at home. But don't forget that many staff find this incredibly difficult. I mean, I know many people, members of my own family, who are not supervisors, but who are working at home. And they're telling me how difficult this is, particularly when they're not used to doing it. And that creates all sorts of challenges which need to be managed. The next point I'd make in, in terms of the 10 issues is prioritization of tasks on the basis of risk. I mean, again, I hope to be able to say a bit more about this later on. But what's clear is that risk has increased across the board as a result of this crisis. It's hard to think of an area which has, where risk has not increased, you know, financial crime, prudential issues, uh, conduct issues, uh, and so on. But supervisory resources, of course, have not increased, and they've diminished to some extent, and certainly they're possibly less effective when people are working from home. So supervisors have had to think very carefully about their priorities and about their risk tolerances, if I can put it that way, um, and have had to prioritize. And that the most effective or the optimum prioritization may well not be the most obvious one. So, of course, people are looking at high impact systemic firms and the prudential soundness of those. But don't lose sight of other things like conduct issues, financial crime issues. And for that matter, smaller firms, lower impact firms, don't ignore them. You can't ignore them because they could be a significant source of risk. Two more points briefly. Don't lose sight of your internal governance and management processes. And when people are working away from the office, when they're working at home, it's very easy for them to lose sight of normal uh, confidentiality rules, um, the data security uh, issues. It's easy for them to forget to record issues or to go through proper channels for making decisions. Those are really important. Uh, they're important anyway, which is why we do them as business as usual, but they're also important because supervisors will be called to account for what they did and why they did it. And it's very important that those processes, you know, bureaucratic though they may appear, are uh, complied with, even though it may be difficult when people aren't in the office.
And the final point, really, that came out of the 10 issues paper is the don't forget that this, this issue, this emergency, is both unprecedented in terms of its breadth and may well last for a very long time. Even as we get some signs in some countries of normalization, it isn't really. This is going to go on for some time. And the nature of the risks will change over time. So if you think you've got a handle on all the risks that are out there now, that's good. But be alert because they are likely to change. They will mutate into other risks. And unexpected issues will arise and you need to be alert to those as well. I was thinking of an example of that, and I think I put it in the paper that came out of some previous uh, crises, where when in some countries where there's been a problem with insurance, for example, the insurance sector, um, motorists have found suddenly that they weren't covered. There's a statutory requirement for them to have, you know, insurance, uh, third party insurance for motoring, and they suddenly found they didn't have it and they weren't able to drive. Now, I don't, I haven't, I haven't heard of any examples of that particular issue in this instance, but it's an example of how a crisis like this can produce broader consequences, and you need to be alert to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, you're underscoring some very important points. I mean, at the end of the day, we also have to recognize supervisors are humans like everybody else, human beings like everybody else. And, you know, even when we're all working from home, one of the things that we're watching, those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work, is the blurring of the boundaries, time and space, and the burnout that comes with that and all the other dislocations that happen. I mean, on a personal level, not that anyone should care, but I'm relegated to work in the basement here, <laughs> trying to do all this stuff here. And then others in the house are occupying other spaces there. And it's not always the most uh, convenient arrangement, but you know, we do what we can, but your points are absolutely critical. Also, uh, just to connect some dots here, Toronto Center a few weeks ago launched a community of practice on DCPs. I would like to ask my colleague Diana to please put up the uh, uh, notice for the next one that's coming up, which is on Wednesday, May 20. As you can see, if you haven't registered, please do. Space is limited. These are high quality uh, interactive uh, formats, uh, forums, and our dedicated uh, program leader for this is uh, uh, Chen Hui Eng, uh, who's, who's an expert in supervision. And uh, also for any information on matters related to BCP or other support that's there, including the papers that uh, Clive and Paul have written, please um, check our uh, dedicated website, crisis at torontocenter.org. Again, crisis at torontocenter.org. By now, all our followers know how to spell center um, in Toronto Center way. Thank you, Diana. Also, a uh, big shout out to our participants. We have a couple of hundred participants, basically, and they cover all uh, letters of the alphabet, pretty much, from Armenia to Zimbabwe. So welcome to all of you. I'm just going to shout out a few. If I'm missing you, doesn't mean I'm, we're not grateful to have you. It's just that you know, I want to leave time for uh, Clive and Paul. So we have Bank of Ghana, Malaysia. We have uh, Honduras, ECCD, Guernsey, FSC, IMF, IAD, uh, Peru, uh, World Bank, on and on and on. Thank you so much. Clive, turning back to you. These are difficult, unprecedented times. How many times have you said that? But, you know, misery is an important thing to uh, commiserate around. This pandemic has had a significant adverse impact on credit quality. In other words, created difficulties for people accessing credit or for the unemployed not to lose their home. In another recent TC note, you will discuss some of the immediate and medium term options for banking supervisors to address these issues. Could you please elaborate? Uh, yes, certainly. Thanks, Babak. Uh, I think probably the simplest way of approaching this is to think of three uh, key elements that are going on out there. Uh, the first, absolutely clear, is that the COVID-19 outbreak has had a significant negative impact on uh, economic growth, uh, indeed to the extent to which uh, most most countries, or at least countries on average now, according to the IMF, are very much in negative territory in terms of economic growth. And that inevitably has uh, a negative impact on credit quality. The second is that as a result of either banks offering it or customers asking for it or governments or conduct supervisors mandating it, uh, a lot of borrowers are currently taking payment holidays. So yes, they are supposed to pay up uh, 
the backlog eventually, but at the moment they are not necessarily obliged to make interest payments or repayments of principal. And the third is that there are a lot of measures uh, in various countries involving government subsidies, central bank actions, uh, macroprudential measures to uh, reduce uh, the capital buffers that banks need to hold, whatever it might be, all attempting to uh, sustain uh, the position of both economies as a whole and individual firms and individual households. Uh, broadly speaking, in the hope that there will be a reasonably rapid, often called V-shaped economic recovery uh, in the near future. So those are the three uh, key backdrops. And in response to that, what should supervisors be thinking about? Well, first, there's a question about the accounting and regulatory capital treatment of loans where those payment holidays have been put in place. And the advice there, uh, generally speaking, is to say that people should take a flexible approach so that if as a result of a payment holiday, uh, a borrower does not meet payments for say 90 days, that does not mean that that loan is automatically put into default and therefore treated differently under accounting and prudential capital purposes. However, it's very important that that flexibility is not overused. Uh, banks still need to distinguish as far as possible uh, between those borrowers who should be able to repay in full in due course once this is all over, and those borrowers who may not be able to, and indeed in some cases, as many countries have already seen, uh, those corporates who have already failed and gone into administration or liquidation. There's no way they're going to uh, repay in full. So what should supervisors be doing here? Well, first, they should be monitoring supervised firms' own processes for making that distinction between different types of borrower. Now, how are they doing that? How robust is it? How consistent is it? And to some extent, supervisors can do that by speaking to each individual lender. Uh, but the other thing which supervisors are uniquely able to do uh, is to look across the spectrum and ask who are the outliers? Who is making a lot of use of this flexibility to such an extent that it's probably gone too far? Or indeed, with major borrowers, the supervisor might take its own view of the creditworthiness of that borrower and then question uh, any bank who also lends to that borrower. Uh, in terms of what view they're taking. The second main thing is that banks themselves and of course supervisors should be undertaking their stress testing for different scenarios. So generally speaking people say well what if it's not a v-shaped rapid recovery? What if it's a u-shaped recovery? What if it's l-shaped which I think means there's no recovery at all? Uh, or what if it's w-shaped which means that it's pretty slow and wobbly and not to be relied on? And it's very important that supervisors, either by looking at banks' own stress tests or by running their own stress tests, are able to form a view of that longer term prospect uh, under different economic scenarios. So how bad is it? How bad could it be? And finally, and this is perhaps looking a bit further ahead, but perhaps we're beginning to move towards this and you'll certainly expect again, both financial institutions and supervisors to be thinking about this, you know, what does the new normal look like? Uh, you know, what is that likely to look like in terms of interest rates, spreads, uh, credit margins, uh, the credit worthiness of borrowers, including sovereigns, international capital flows, use of technology, global supply chains, you know, perceptions of continuing government support or otherwise? Because all of those things will also feed into uh, the credit worthiness of at least some borrowers uh, and will be important parts of the equation further ahead. So just to summarize, I think it's a question of, first of all, looking at the immediate position, uh, making use of the flexibility, but not too much use of it, uh, but also looking ahead and asking a question, well, where would, where would the banks be if in practice we do not have an economic recovery, if credit quality continues to worsen uh, if all of the interventions and governments and central banks and the rest are less effective than is hoped, uh, are we then looking down the barrel of a rather difficult position whereby a number of banks may reach a point at which they are failing or 
indeed has failed and are you prepared for dealing with that? Thank you. Thank you, Clive. That was a uh, pretty comprehensive answer in a very short, compact form. So thank you very much for that. And one of the things that uh, you know, it's very apparent during the course of this interview is that uh, you gentlemen have contributed to a lot of Toronto Center notes, TCNs, and uh, TCNs are being viewed and read by a large group of supervisors out there and also others in the public policy domain. And uh, Clive, I'd like to thank you for being the lead editor for our TCN series and really putting it on the map. So thank you for that. One more thing, Clive, you mentioned here, you touched on it very interesting term, new normal, which is close to our heart. Uh, there's a lot of conversations and talk today about reopening. Sometimes earlier, in fact, people were talking about recovery. It became very apparent that the use of the term recovery is very insensitive, given that all the suffering that's still going on. So people started talking about reopening. However, in our view, it's really about the new normal. I mean, until there is a vaccine and vaccine in such a high quantity, Things are not going to happen in a way that goes back to the past normal. And one of the things I would like to ask Diana to please put up for us is the, um, uh, an, an important event that we are organizing uh, on the very topic of the new normal. So we're bringing three very good speakers. Uh, Dr. Navarro of the WHO was at our very first inaugural uh, uh, pandemics and financial stability. Dr. Stefan Ingves is in the forefront of the European International uh, central banking drive for creating financial stability in the world. And Sokora Heisen, a new member of our Toronto Center's board of director from Peru, is a, a very senior supervisors and, supervisor, and they're going to be bringing us their perspective on the new normal. So please tune in on Tuesday, May 26. This is going to be a very good quality event. And it's actually, we have provided expanded time, an hour and a half, to allow for more of your questions. Thank you very much, Diana. Now, going back to um, <clears throat> you, uh, uh, Paul, uh, staying on the course of where we are today, as an author of another Toronto Center note and series of notes on risk-based supervision, um, RBS is a useful tool to identify and assess emerging risks. Everybody would agree. And also allocate, uh, allocate resources accordingly. In the wake of COVID-19, do you see significant changes in how supervisors should be setting their new priorities? Um, well, the answer to that is um, uh, the response to the COVID emergency needs to be a risk-based one. So the basic ideas of risk-based supervision are as important as ever, but the outcomes of the process may be different. Let me explain what I mean by that. Let's go back a couple of steps to a time when we're not in an emergency, we're in something like business as usual, and remind ourselves what risk-based supervision is. Risk-based supervision is about focusing your resources in the areas of greatest risk. And that sounds incredibly obvious. I'm sure every supervisor in the world would say, well, we do that already. Of course we do. We, we have to prioritize our work, so we do it on that basis. But it's a more rigorous analytical process than that. And it requires you to be clear about two things. First of all, what do you mean by risk? And normally when we, when we, what we say about that is that these are risks to your statutory objectives. So as a supervisor, there are certain things you are required to do. Those will vary from country to country, but you know, prudential soundness, conduct uh, um, regulation, fighting financial crime, usually included in there somewhere. So those are your objectives. The question is, what is going on out there in the firms or in the financial markets which com uh, compromise your ability to meet those objectives? So that's the first thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know is, once you've identified those risks, how do you uh, differentiate among them? So how much do you care, to put it crudely, about different types of risk? For some, you may have absolutely zero tolerance. You may say, well, um, you know, we will not have the systemic consequences of a high impact firm failing. We just simply won't. We have zero tolerance for that. Other things we would prefer to avoid, but we may not be able to avoid them altogether. So we have a different level of tolerance. That's what we mean by risk tolerance in supervision. Now, when we then look at a crisis or an emergency like the current one, and we put it into that framework, what can we say about the COVID emergency? Well, 
there are three things I think we can say. The first one is that risks have pretty much increased across the board. As I said earlier, it's hard to imagine an area where risks have not increased. So firms will, are inevitably more fragile. There is a greater scope now for uh, consumers to be damaged by misconduct in firms. The FATF has reminded us recently of the greatly increased scope for financial crime uh, and, and cybercrime. So risks have increased across the board. First point. Second point is those risks may be distributed differently. So they may not have increased across the board to exactly the same amount. Some of them may have become much more acute than others. And we need to be aware of that. And the third point is, we've already made this point, the supervisory resources available to address those risks are stretched. We may have fewer supervisors available. Some of them may be sick, but even those that aren't sick will be working at home. They'll be less effective. Frankly, it will be harder for them to do their work. So where all of that takes us is, it's necessary to address our risk tolerance, if I can put it that way. Some risks will have increased and there's frankly not much we can do about it. If your staff are working at home, you can tell them to keep observing security protocols and to keep recording decisions and so on and so forth. We hope they will, but it's almost inevitable that some of those risks will have increased and probably we just have to accept it to some degree. There's not much we can do about it. But we have to make decisions about the others. And the question, as always, is how do we trade off things like the soundness of our highest impact firms against the possibility of misconduct by other firms and consumers losing out against the greatly heightened risk of cyber crime uh, and other kinds of financial crime? So in other words, the distribution of those risks will have changed and we need to have a rational process for uh, allocating our resources to them. And as I said earlier, remember also that even if we think we know what the distribution of risks is today, it may well be different next week or next month, because this crisis is likely, or this emergency is likely to persist for some time. Two other points I would make about that is, uh, as I said earlier, don't ignore what you may see as the lower risks. So it'd be tempting to say, oh, look, we've got lots of small firms, they're not, they're, they're not very high risk, they're not very high impact, we'll ignore them. Well, that would be a very bad idea. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't ignore any risks, even the lower risk ones, but also small firms failing, particularly if they do it collectively, can be a big problem. So don't take your eye off the ball, even if you are you think you're looking at lower risk, at least have a mechanism for monitoring, even, even if they don't come on uh, the highest priority. And so the overall message here is you should know what critical risks you face, and you should know how those are changing. And you should have a rational discussion about how to prioritize your resources to take account of those. And it's a dynamic process, it's not a static one, so you need to keep on doing it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Paul. Paul, I'm just taking a look at the questions from the audience. There's one question that's actually very uh, uh, appropriate, could be a good follow-up to ask you. So Clive, if I could ask your patience for a second. This is from our friend, uh, Chris Cardosa. So I'm trying to be confidential about the people, but if I recognize some of them, I'll give him a shout out. Um, what would be top three or like let's say top three questions that supervisors should be asking risk management and boards to determine if they are being proactive in managing through the crisis and making proactive decisions and acting on them? What would be your top line suggestion on that? Well, uh, first of all, hello, Chris. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, look, I think this is very interesting and I think it may anticipate um, something we're going to talk about later. But I, it's a really, it's a very good question because as I said earlier on, this communication issue is absolutely key. It's very difficult to communicate with firms at the moment. It may be even harder to communicate with boards at the moment who, you know, are probably not meeting, but well, they certainly are not meeting physically uh, and so on. The questions I would ask um, are, um, and Chris, I think, knows that I'm very attached to this idea, what I call open-ended questions. So, yes, I want to know that your risk management function is functioning, that you have a risk manager, that their staff are functioning properly, that you are identifying and monitoring risks and doing all the things that people normally do. But I would additionally ask in this question, in this case, in the current circumstances, what are those risks? What have you concluded about those higher risks? Uh, what are you deprioritizing and what are you giving the highest priority to in terms of your risk management? How do you know what they are? How are you monitoring them? How are you measuring them? Questions you'd ask normally in business as usual, but I'd ask them in the context of these changed circumstances. 
And you critically hit on the question of the boards, which we may come to a little bit later on, I suspect. But um, many supervisors don't have much interaction with banks' boards, in particular, or supervised firms' boards. Uh, and we make the point in, in, I think, certainly two of the papers that we've published recently, that is wrong. You should have a lot of interaction with boards, and especially you should be having it now. And the question I would ask is, OK, board, it may be very difficult for you to, or you can't meet at the moment, you understand that you probably don't want to get in the way, you, you want to leave it to the management to manage the firm, that's quite understandable, but no, excuse, sorry, you have a crucial leadership role to play. You need to demonstrate leadership, you need to do the usual things the board is supposed to do, which is providing strategic direction and making sure that risks are controlled. And I would start off by asking the chairman of any board, of any large financial institution, what are you doing? How are you doing that? How are you meeting? How are you interacting with the senior management? And you tell me, board, three things that you've done in the last six or seven weeks to help give the firm direction and to make sure the controls are functioning. Uh, now, you know, so I would ask those open-ended questions uh, and expect to be given a convincing answer to them. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Clive, um, uh, we're entering an area where a lot of the questions are interrelated. So going back to you, uh, strong corporate governance is key. Uh, for us at Toronto Center, it's an app, um, motherhood statement. is a fun foundation of a lot of our leadership thinking and courses. What are the main issues that supervisors need to address in supervising corporate governance? And what additional pressures and challenges does COVID-19 outbreak bring to corporate governance? Yeah, thanks, Babak. Uh, well, I think this relates back partly to Paul's answer to uh, Chris Cardoza's question. But just to state first, I think that in a crisis, if anything, good corporate governance becomes even more important. Uh, it's important in the normal times, but it becomes even more important because the things that Paul was talking about, the leadership, the direction, the challenge and support of the executive, uh, all need to happen during a crisis, and perhaps they need to happen even more during a crisis. Um, it's clear, as Paul said, that firms are facing difficulties. Uh, as he said, the risks have gone up across the whole spectrum of risks, and they are facing the operational constraints and pressures that all firms are facing in terms of staff working at home, boards and senior management having to operate virtually. But coming back to Paul's point, yes, uh, it is important that supervisors uh, keep monitoring this subject. It's not so difficult to do. I sometimes get the feeling that supervisors think, well, I don't know much about corporate governance. I don't know much about the way the firm operates. I don't want to look silly by asking questions. Uh, and anyway, I don't really want to start having discussions with the chair of the board of a major institution. And one of the points we make in the, in the notes is that actually this is an opportunity to do more, not an excuse to do less in this area. You know, there's absolutely no reason why a supervisor shouldn't arrange a phone call uh, with a member of a board or senior management, or indeed have a conference call uh, and bring in a number of them and run through the sorts of questions that Paul was mentioning. The questions themselves are not all that difficult. They are deliberately open-ended and they are designed to elicit uh, how a board is exercising leadership and direction in these troubled times. So, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't ask questions like, how is the board operating during the crisis? How does that work? Um, has the firm implemented its business continuity plan? In which case, what went well, what went less well? Who is monitoring that implementation? Uh, as Paul mentioned, do members of the board clearly understand, monitor and manage the shifting pattern of risks facing their firm? Uh, how can they provide assurance to you as a supervisor that their risk governance and risk management is working properly and that they know they have adequate capital, solvency, liquidity, and other resources? Uh, are they cooperating fully with the supervisors? Are they keeping the supervisors informed of developments? Uh, are they, which is equally important for the supervisors themselves, keeping sight of other key issues during the crisis? Um, you know, are they still focusing on areas like uh, climate change and the risks arising from that? Are they still focusing on financial inclusion and such issues? Uh, and finally, as the crisis begins to unwind and we come back to the, uh, the new normal terminology, 
are they beginning to think about how their strategy and business plan might need to change in order to cope with those pressures? Because if they leave that thinking too late, uh, they may find themselves in a situation where they are no longer viable because the, the world has moved on whilst they were dealing with the immediate crisis. And unless a board is focusing on that strategic aspect of the business, uh, that isn't going to happen. And the firm may therefore find itself in a difficult position as a result. So that's just a sample, really. That's just seven or eight areas which supervisors could literally pick up a phone or arrange a video conference to discuss with members of the board of the firm that they supervise. Uh, you know, they may be difficult questions to answer, but they're not difficult questions for a supervisor to ask. And I think they'll learn an awful lot about the running of the firm from the answers they receive from members of the board to those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clive. And Paul, I'm just going to give you, uh, as the last structured question, to give you an opportunity to sort of uh, maybe wrap it up on the corporate governance uh, that uh, Clive very ably put forward. So in your view, what are the tools for supervisors to monitor and where necessary to improve the standards of corporate governance in the firms they supervise, especially in the context of COVID? Well, let me, uh, I will answer that question in just a moment, if I may, but I just like to say something else first. First of all, I completely agree with everything Clive has just said. If I could just go back a little bit, um, it is my experience that a lot of supervisors have real difficulty in supervising corporate governance. And I think there are two reasons for that. One, one is because in many countries there's a cultural issue. You know, the people who get appointed to the boards of banks, particularly big banks, are often the great and the good, you know, former ministers or generals or whatever they are. And a lot of supervisors say, oh, it's very difficult to go and uh, have um, a full conversation with people like that, asking potentially difficult questions. I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Well, my response to that is that should not be an issue. It is, the, it is your duty as a supervisor to ask those difficult questions, and it is the duty of the board member, whoever they are, um, to respond to them fully. Of course, you will ask them in an appropriately polite and respectful way, but I'm sorry, it's your job to ask difficult questions, and it is the job of the board member to answer them, and it doesn't matter who they are in terms of their former role or their seniority or whatever. That's one reason people find it hard. The other reason they find it hard, and this goes to something Clive was just saying, is because when you're assessing corporate governance, it is one area where what I might call the architecture, the structures, only take you so far. So sure, yes, you want to know there's a board, you want to know it meets six times a year, you want to know that it has meetings and minutes and it has committees and all the rest of it. That's fine. Those are essential conditions. You won't get anywhere without those. But those things in themselves don't tell you what you want to know, whether, which is whether the board is effective, whether it's doing anything that's worthwhile. And the only way you can really get to that is to ask, Clive put his finger on it, open-ended questions. How do you function? What is your attitude towards risk? When was the last time the board took a decision which had a material impact on the firm's risk-taking behavior? Now, those are hard questions, but board members should be able to answer them. That's why they're there. And uh, those open-ended questions are quite hard to formulate. It is also quite hard to evaluate the answer. So there's a real skill the supervisors have to develop in order to be able to pursue that sort of line of questioning. But it is critically important in my view that they do it. So um, actually, I very much agree with Clive. If you don't do this already, for whatever reason, you should do it. And in fact, the crisis gives you an opportunity to start doing it because boards are an essential source of information about how firms are being run and how they're being controlled. And it, once we are back to this new normal, whenever that is, Carry on doing it because it is really important, but it does involve the development of certain skills, particularly to do with evaluation of article of uh, complicated um, answers to complicated questions. Or no, sorry, complicated answers to simple questions. Actually, you will often ask a simple question: "Tell me about how you evaluate risk." The question then is, "How do you evaluate the board member's answer?" Which may not be uh, completely straightforward. It's a skill that has to be developed. Thank you. You. I guess one of the biggest things you learn in life is simple can be complicated or simple is not easy, right? So that's very true. Um, thank you very much for that. So we have some interesting questions. Uh, you know, it's always important to understand that supervisors have limited resources, right? So this next questionnaire says, 
how do supervisors balance between not ignoring lower risks yet prioritizing higher risk areas when financially constrained amidst COVID-19? So I guess, um, I don't know, uh, Clive, would you like to take this question? Uh, yeah, certainly. Thanks, Babak. Well, I think as Paul was saying, uh, it is inevitable that if, if the risks have increased most uh, for the most important, systemically important financial institutions in your country, uh, then almost inevitably there's going to be some shift of supervisory resources towards that. So, as Paul was saying, in a way, risks have increased everywhere, but on the risk-based approach, you then need to focus on where they've increased most, and that may well be that the systemically important firms are what you should be focusing most on, uh, even more in a crisis than in normal times. But that said, uh, having, having some ability to monitor uh, the risks to lower impact firms or some of the risks which may be bubbling up under the surface and beginning to emerge uh, is important. Uh, and I think what that requires is uh, a very clear decision by the board and senior management of the supervisory authority on how the resources should be uh, allocated uh, and doing so in a way which makes that clear to staff so that they understand uh, what they should be doing in each area. Uh, but I think as Paul was saying, don't lose sight of anything completely, but it may be that you need to look at it in a different way in the crisis. It may be that you need to take an even more thematic approach. So you're looking at the sector of small firms as a whole, rather than in any sense trying to think about the position of any individual small firm. Uh, and to think about the way in which those types of firms may be affected by the shifting risks that we've been talking about. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is also from another friend of Toronto Centre, George Brady. I'm going to try to keep all these uh, confidential, but as I said, if I see them, I'll shout out. Uh, could you comment on these challenges in the context of supervision of global firms? specifically related to communication and cooperation across borders. Pretty important point. Uh, Paul, over to you. Well, I think it's striking. Uh, thank you, Babak. I think it's striking, really, from this discussion, how many times we have said, although these are exceptional times, and goodness knows they are exceptional times, in a way, what we need to see is a kind of accentuation of what we do already. So there are some things we're doing which, which are most unusual. But in some respects, we're all, you know, we're continuing to do risk-based supervision, even though the outcomes may be different from the ones we're used to. And I think this question is, a, is another example of that. I mean, what we say to people in business as usual, where we have global firms, again, is communication. We need colleges. When there is a crisis, we need crisis management groups. Um, and what we need is a network where supervisors of a particular group, a global group, can talk to each other freely, about emerging issues and about the measures that they are taking. Now, it seems to me that in the current circumstances, none of that changes. It may well be the need for it is heightened. Um, certainly, if I, I used to be supervisor, actually, of global groups, uh, non-UK non ones in the UK, all the major global groups except the UK ones. Um, and we had a relationship with home supervisors there where we would expect them, and, and typically they did do this, to tell us when there was a problem that we needed to know about and which it would affect either a branch or a subsidiary. And similarly, you know, those where we were the home supervisor, we would aim to keep host supervisors well informed. So I don't think I see the architecture of this uh, as necessarily being any different from the one that we normally have in terms, as I say, of colleges and crisis management groups. What I would say is the need for that continuous communication um, and uh, survey and vigilance in respect of risk uh, is probably greater than it, than it ever has been. Okay, great, thank you. So this next question is actually brings a human touch, uh, which is interesting. And uh, uh, both of you in, uh, gentlemen are uh, very cerebral and intellectual in thinking through these issues and highlighting them well. So Clive, uh, this one goes to you. We as supervisors sometimes forget in our BCPs the risk to staff of isolation including the psychological impacts of working from home, away from you know, office. This can lead to loss of productivity and shortness of uh, uh, you know, staff resources, 
What can supervisors do to mitigate this significant risk? Well, I think this is, a, this is clearly a tricky one. Um, and it's also clearly an issue that faces all firms, not just supervisory authorities. Uh, any firm where its staff is working at home faces these same issues. And I think looking at what firms are doing successfully in this area um, is an approach which involves perhaps more frequent and, and, and more frequent efforts to ensure that there is communication uh, between managers and their staff. Uh, so quite a lot of checking in uh, you know, at the beginning of the day, make sure everyone's prepared for the day. Um, you know, do they all have the appropriate software and hardware and data and in information to do whatever tasks are required of them? And also checking in individually with people on a perhaps slightly more formal basis than you might where you just bump into them in the office because you're not doing that anymore, but saying, well, let's, let, let's just have a chat later this afternoon and see how you're getting on. Uh, and let's be prepared to discuss some of these issues which are certainly arising in terms of the effect on people of working from home. Uh, be that about psychology and mental health, uh, be it about the ability to do so in perhaps a very cramped location where there are two other people in the household who are also trying to hold business conversations at the same time or in a country where the connectivity is a problem so people keep losing touch because they simply cannot connect virtually through the through the networks um, so i think it's as i say it's, it's it's a matter of making an effort um, perhaps making more effort than usual to communicate with staff um, and to bring staff together to discuss some of these things. Um, on a previous uh, webinar, which I think has been recorded, so I guess people can go back and watch it from the Toronto Centre of Resources, uh, Martin Maloney, who's the Chief Supervisor uh, in Jersey, uh, was, was, was saying how much effort they'd put into um, making sure that people could work from home, not just in terms of do they have the equipment, um, but, but, but again, do they have these other capacities? Do they have particular issues that need raising? Do they have particular constraints uh, on them working from home? And, and how best can they be addressed by the supervisory authority? Uh, so as with most of these types of issues, the most important thing as the questioner here has done is to identify that this is a potential issue and then to think through the, you know, the myriad of ways in which it can be addressed. Um, I don't know how many people in the audience are members of LinkedIn, for example, but one of the things that has been very noticeable in the last few months uh, on that particular network has been the number of people who have been contributing uh, ideas and lessons on things that have worked well or less well in their own organization about working from home. So there does seem to be a growing database, if you like, uh, of information about what people could do to uh, try to avoid the sort of unfortunate circumstances which the questioner alluded to. Yeah, thank you, uh, Clive. Uh, that, was, that was very good. And also, I'd really like to thank the uh, questioner for this important question. The human dimension always is very key. We also had a podcast in which we interviewed a registered uh, therapist uh, who talked to us about this issue. And one of the big insights I remember from that is during these times of isolation, protect your relationships. So, you know, Clive talked about the business side of it. There's also the personal side of it, right? Let's not take any of these things for granted because in this fast pacing, fast paced changing life of uh, technology and everything that's getting integrated, at the end of the day, we still are a bundle of nerves and emotions on top of all the mental facility and capacities that we have. And keep your equanimity in check. The next question um, I'm going to pose to you, Paul. Uh, both you and Clive worked in integrated, uh, I mean, you, you are known at the Toronto Center for what you teach in our banking programs, for, uh, but you know, throughout your careers, you did work in integrated supervisory authorities, so you have an understanding of the other sectors as well. So do your insights related to the challenges supervisors face affect the insurance sector differently, Paul? Um, no, I don't think they do. Um, I mean, well, the first point I should make is that I'm aware that in some of the um, comments I've made earlier, uh, 
I've been talking about trading off, for example, prudential things against conduct issues and financial crime issues. I should, be, I should point out that I'm aware that, of course, in many supervisory bodies, those things are separate. We have a Twin Peaks model where uh, conduct uh, issues are not dealt with in the same in, in supervisory body as prudential ones. Now, where that's the case, of course, that still further heightens the need for communication uh, amongst different functional uh, regulators. But to go to this particular question, do the issues um, differ when it comes to the supervision of insurance? Uh, I would say absolutely not. Um, the risks, of course, might uh, in terms of, you know, we know that insurers' balance sheets are almost the inverse of banks, you know, balance sheets. They're, you know, ten, they, they have very long uh, um, uh, liability structures, for example. So the, the risk characteristics of those sectors are different. But the, the basic issue which says that you know, we need to understand what those risks are, we need to understand how those potentially impact our statutory objectives. So we are just as much concerned about the soundness of insurers as we are about the soundness of banks. If we have responsibility for it, we're just as concerned about conduct issues, possibly even more so because the contracts are longer term in insurers than in banks. So uh, as with all risk-based activities, it may be that the ways in which those risks manifest themselves obviously will differ as between banks and insurers. But the basic job of ensuring that you know, we understand those risks, that we calibrate them, that we allocate our resources appropriately, I think is exactly the same. I see no conflict at all between uh, banking supervision and insurance prudential supervision and where we have conduct, of course, we, we have to take account of that as well. But no, the answer is, uh, in brief, no, I, I don't see uh, any, any difference. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. And, uh, and Clive, going back to the premise of where I started, where the economy, the world economy basically came down to its knee because of this virus and at the drop of a hat. Uh, this questioner goes on and says, in um, some situations, moral suasion can only go so far when financial institutions are concerned about survival. How do supervisors balance between using moral suasion and using a firmer approach in these circumstances? Oh God, well, that's a, that's a very wide question. Um, I think the first point I'd make is that it is very important that there's a mechanism to address some of the inherent trade-offs, possibly even tensions and conflicts uh, that operate here. So yes, it, it, it may be that governments and conduct supervisors in particular are pushing for banks to be as flexible as possible uh, in dealing with the position of borrowers and being prepared to uh, implement payment holidays and various other uh, helpful facilities for, for the borrowers. On the other hand, the prudential supervisors are sitting there thinking, well, this is all very well, this is all a good thing, we can see the value of that, uh, but it may be storing up problems down the road. Um, so but if you're overly flexible, as I was saying, in the context of credit risk, uh, you may end up in a situation where the uh, non-performing loans have piled up to an extent that actually borrowers are not able to repay them in full in the future and the bank is facing a serious shortfall in capital as a result. So I think the most important thing therefore is to analyse what the potential impacts are uh, of these potential measures uh, and to think about well where are these trade-offs and how are we going to resolve them? What is the institutional structure for resolving them? How do we get together in a room, the finance minister, the central bank, the supervisors, the macro prudential authority, whoever it might be, to think all of this through? And then if the question is in terms of moral suasion um, about, well, hang on a minute, we're trying to persuade the banks to be flexible and helpful to their borrowers, but um, if, we, if we do that, uh, we are running too many risks in the future, but nevertheless, the authorities think that is the best thing to do, having balanced all of these trade-offs. Uh, if moral suasion doesn't get you there, then you may have to do what a number of countries have done, which is the government steps in and declares some form of payment moratorium and just says that the obligation to repay uh, is temporarily removed from the borrower. And if, a, if the government does that, there isn't very much that a bank can do about it because you no longer have any right to demand immediate payments from the borrower. The borrower can say, no, as a moratorium, I don't need to pay until six to 12 months time, whatever it might be. Um, so I think it depends 
as ever with this balance between moral suasion and some form of regulatory or even legislative intervention, you know, how desperate are you to achieve the object? Um, how much resistance are you facing? And therefore, at what point you need to switch from moral suasion and persuasion uh, into taking a more legislative or rule-based approach. But it's a difficult one. No doubt about that. And the number of countries are clearly wrestling with precisely these sort of issues at the moment and will continue to do so for the next few months. Yeah, that's true. It's a complex question and uh, uh, covers the waterfront. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I wanted uh, to thank you again for uh, your participation today. It was a full hour. We still left a couple of questions on the table, but uh, they will not be uh, gone to uh, the black space. We will actually take, take a look at them more carefully for our other programs and other webinars. And once again, thanks so much for your, your goodwill, your time for Toronto Center and all the efforts that you put into our programs. And one observation I have is sometimes we try to think outside of the box. It's very refreshing to see that you gentlemen stayed inside the box of supervision and provided a lot of interesting insights and connected the dots very carefully in these very difficult times. Thanks again, and, uh, and we will bring you back to our uh, other webinars in the future. And we hope to see our audience at another one of Toronto Center's webinars uh, in this series. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.